All right. So let's get this uh, stand-up comedy night started. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, security, especially mobile security. Um, thank you guys for coming. Um, and thank you for sharing with us uh, alcohol and pizza, which is uh, always great. And um, before I begin, I want to give you guys a quick overview of what you're seeing. So on the left-hand side there, you see Codemetrics dashboard for iOS team. Uh, on the right, you see Codemetrics for the Android team. On the back there, you see uh, all our real-time metrics for the systems running. Grinder, so I got a lot of questions about that today, so there it is. And uh, today we're going to focus on building secure mobile applications. And um, one thing that I want to start with is that there is no such thing as perfect security. I think uh, what Salman Rushdie said summarizes it very well, that it's only, uh, we have only varying levels of insecurity. And uh, one thing that I want to say today is that I want you to use today's Tech Talk as a guideline to evalu evaluating your security stance uh, or as a guideline to evaluate your security architecture. I'm going to be talking about various different areas of security and I'm going to list out a whole bunch of uh, subtopics that you would have to research if you're building uh, mobile secure applications. Um, but I'm not going to have time to dive in into all of it. So I'm going to just focus on certain topics and I also want to make sure that we give some time for Curtis May, who is our senior um, iOS developer. He's going to focus uh, specifically on some security concepts when, when it comes to building uh, iOS client. Okay? So, having said that, let's talk about who we are. Um, uh, hence, uh, who knows uh, what Grindr is? Almost everybody. So, Grindr is the largest uh, gay dating network in the world. We're in over, over 200 countries now. Uh, we have close to 1 million active uh, users uh, hourly. Uh, if you actually look, there's a graph there that actually shows that. Uh, we, have, we serve people from all over the world. Uh, that translates to pretty healthy traffic. We, we process around 10,000 calls per second. Uh, and then that, that obviously translates to a whole bunch of other calls on the back end. Um, the company was started in 2009, so we've been around for, for, for a while, but uh, we never took any venture capital investment, um, and uh, the company grew very fast, and we're very profitable, uh, and we enjoy the space very much. Uh, we focus on uh, engineering quality uh, and engineering excellence in everything what we do. That's why we have these here. We want to at all times see how good our code base is, right? And that's very important, uh, not only when it comes to actual coding side, but security as well, because uh, your engineering excellence translates into good product and translates into um, how well you can actually apply security principles to your uh, application, okay? Uh, very quickly, um, this is our uh, stack. So I call it awesome stack of awesome, awesomeness. The, the back end runs on a non-blocking I.O. framework called Akka. Uh, we write business components in Java. Akka leverages Scala. Um, the uh, chat cluster that's powering all the chat is written in Erlang. Uh, and we leverage Elasticsearch and Redis and a whole bunch of different NoSQL databases to, to make it really fast. In fact, there is a talk that I gave in New York on scaling mobile applications around the world. You may want to look it up on, on YouTube if you're interested. And also, one thing that I forgot, and I don't want Hassan to kill me later on, is if you guys hear something that you like, uh, tweet about it and use uh, hashtag GrindyLabs. Okay, that's going to help us out a lot. All right. Um, so moving on to security, uh, mobile security. So there, the, I want to talk about very quickly about anatomy of the possible attack. So we've got three different areas, and I will I organize my talk in those three different areas. So obviously you have device, uh, and and there's a whole suite of topics that we're going to talk about there. Then you have a transport layer that actually shuttles all the information from the device to the back end. We call it network here, and then you have your data center. So when it comes to device, uh, again. 
I'm not going to focus on all these different areas. I'm going to focus on, on various different things uh, just to highlight some topics. But again, if, if you're interested more into diving uh, into all these things, please use this presentation as a guide, take pictures, and then you can research it on your own time. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, when it comes to um, the vice, one thing that uh, is uh, probably the worst thing that can happen is, is iOS uh, jailbreaking and Android rooting because that essentially gives access to anything that's happening on the phone. Uh, people can actually grab the binary or the application distributable and do whatever they want with it. I can tell you that from our example, uh, our biggest security hole that we will be plugging uh, this year is the fact that uh, hackers would um, do Android rooting and then download the Android client and they would reverse engineer it and then decompile it, everything, and then they can very quickly figure out what is your security scheme, how are you using tokens, what kind of tokens you're using, uh, and then, you know, um, it's uh, game over after that because they can start writing fake clients that still use your APIs, and they appear as if this was a grind application, right? So, uh, big, big uh, problem. Uh, the way we are uh, actually uh, targeting that um, I'm going to talk about, about that li a little bit uh, later. And uh, one thing that I want to touch upon here is also encryption. So uh, there's a lot of apps out there being built that there's no thought put into any server encryption. Uh, we need to talk about how you store data on the device, right? So if you're using SQLite or any sort of other means to actually store data on the device because you're caching stuff, whatever you're doing, uh, remember that if all these things happen, then, then users can actually get access to that data and, and, and actually uh, use it, right? Um, so uh, encryption is, is very important to consider. Um, moving on to network. Again, uh, I highlighted uh, encryption because um, a lot of times people use mobile applications in public places, right? So you found a Wi-Fi in Starbucks and, and, and you're doing a whole bunch of stuff. Um, you know, the public networks do not give you the same security like your home private network. Uh, so if there's someone there watching the network traffic and if, if your network traffic is not being encrypted, you're not taking basic uh, security measure like using TLS uh, or HD, old HTTPS, uh, then they can literally sit there and watch all the traffic coming by and, and capture that information, right? So it's very important for you to uh, encrypt that. One thing that I also highlighted is session hijacking. So uh, there are standard security protocols that are in use today like OpenID, OAuth 2.0, there are other ones uh, that allow you to define how you exchange security tokens between your device and a backend server. Um, one thing that you need to make sure of is that uh, you actually expire those tokens periodically because if you're on the public network someone captures those tokens, then they can essentially appear, use those tokens to interact with the back end as if they were you, right? And then, then you have a problem. So uh, one thing that, um, uh, let, let's say you look at like an OAuth to the old scheme, you have two, two different types of tokens. The, the one that is used the most is called the um, bearer token or session token. You want to expire these things every 15 minutes. So even if someone captures that information, they can be you only for 15 minutes, um, and and after that you have to renew again, right? So you're you're just raising the bar a little bit, right? Um, and uh, when it comes to uh, data center, I would say that um, I want to focus on brute force attacks. So let's say you have RESTful APIs that are living in some sort of rack space environment or AWS environment, and you've exposed a whole bunch of uh, RESTful APIs. Uh, if hackers find out what your authentication APIs are, um, then, you know, if you don't have certain things in place, they can just set up a big compute farm and brute force check different password user IDs and try to get in, right? So one thing that um, I, I want to also highlight is something called rate limiting, right? So rate limiting is essentially a technique that you can use on the backend side to count the number of requests per user and start plotting a normal client behavior. So when you're building your mobile client that is powered by RESTful APIs, 
it is a good idea to profile that client in terms of what is the natural uh, rate of calls that that client makes to the back end, right? And then you build an infrastructure on the back end to measure that. Because if you don't, then you will never detect people who, let's say, wrote some sort of a rogue uh, Java applications or PHP scripts or whatever that are running on the server somewhere and they're just hammering you, right? So you want to limit, it's called rate limiting, right? Um, and then let's go into some recommendations. So uh, when it comes to um, code, um, when you're writing your code and you're writing your mobile applications, uh, you want to increase the complexity use obfuscation. So what are we doing for Android client, right? Andro we, on the Android client, we're going to be using something called DexGuard. DexGuard is a um, third-party tool that allows you to essentially take your Java code and obfuscate everything, encrypt as much as it can be encrypted. So even if you, even someone roots the Android phone, grabs your binary, uh, and they decompile it, it's going to be very, very difficult to, for them to figure out what's going on, right? Um, and another thing that I want to say is that um, what I've seen is that the biggest security risk is uh, actually coming a lot of times from third-party libraries. So uh, developers are, are, you know, very happy about going out there. It's like, oh, I want to play with this library. I want to play with that library. There's a lot of open source software out there that makes developers' lives much, much easier. However, if you don't evaluate the, those libraries from the perspective of security holes, uh, then, then you know your code could be secure, but because you've brought something into your ecosystem that hasn't been evaluated, it could be a Trojan horse, right? And and you may never even know that something is going on, right? Um, let's talk about handling of sensitive data. So um, I mentioned before that you want to implement secure data storage. So if you are using any sort of database on the client side, if you're using the file system, you want to uh, make sure that you're in a good habit of encrypting that stuff. So don't store anything in the clear text because that, that data could be grabbed very quickly on the rooted devices or jbroken devices, right? Um, and I want to focus a little bit on geolocation. So Grindr is all about geolocation uh, and uh, geolocation is, uh, can, has to be handled very, very uh, carefully. So I can tell you that uh, there are certain governments in the world that try to use our platform to uh, actually find people who are gay and it was actually in countries where you can go to jail or be stoned to death and whatever, right? So, so how you transmit that information about the user, uh, especially if you have a global application with users in, in a whole bunch of different jurisdictions, it is, it is very important for you to pay attention how you transmit that information um, and uh, um, you, 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 you take care, right? You, 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 shouldn't, you shouldn't be transmitting that information uh, uh, without, uh, without encryption, without making sure that uh, people cannot easily get at it, right? Uh, and that also goes for distance from, because distance from, although doesn't give you precise location, but you can use something called trilateration with multiple points. If, if I know distance from to someone, from five different points, all I need is three. I can draw a circle and, and kind of approximate someone's location, right? So, so, so that's something you have to be very careful about. Um, and uh, let's talk about two-factor authentication. So I, I would say that in today's mobile development ecosystem, two-factor is a must, right? So you need to be able to make sure that you um, are able to, as much as possible, tie the user to their device uh, so you can use something like push or SMS that only devices, actual physical devices, can receive. Um, so I'll give you an example. If, if I, let's say, uh, download <clears throat> Android uh, application, I reverse engineer it, I figure out how everything works, then I write a Java client that mimics that behavior and deploy it to, let's say, AWS to kind of have a spam bomb, right? Um, without two-factor authentication, there's no way for me to distinguish between the actual mobile device and that spam bot, right? But if I require SMS verification with a code or push, silent push verification of a code so the user doesn't see it, now uh, I'm eliminating all that stuff out, right? 
there's still a way to get around it, but I'm making it cost prohibitive because now the guys need to get a farm of 100 or 500 actual devices that are all rooted, rooted and then they have to essentially do that with actual devices, right? It's still possible. Uh, again, no security is perfect, but I'm just raising the bar and I'm trying to make it as, as cost prohibitive as possible for these guys to, to, to get at, at, at your uh, uh, APIs. Uh, I want to touch a little bit about um, log. Um, a lot of developers, when they build stuff, they like to log a lot of stuff to, to see how the application works. Make sure that in your code reviews and evaluation of whatever is getting pushed out, number one, all that stuff is uh, stripped out, ideally. Uh, if you're not stripping out that code, then at least make sure that uh, everything is not in a debug, right? Because the, the worst thing would be for you to, for your application to actually start logging sensitive information on the device. And like I said, is the device, if the device is rooted, then, then everyone can, can get it, right? Um, and then uh, I'm not going to spend too much time here because uh, Curtis is going to talk about iOS. Um, but um, for Android, I want to stress that you, you should always sign your Android APK. There's, there's so many apps out there that, uh, that they're, they've never been signed. People don't pay attention to, to actual security certificates. Uh, those are just good practices that you should definitely follow. Um, and the last thing I want to touch on is um, proper server configuration on the back end. So we kind of jumped from application, we talked about transmission and network, we talked about some good practices on the code side. Um, when it comes to actual uh, your server infrastructure, um, usually what happens is the, the, the biggest breaches happen because of sysops engineer or devops engineer fat fingered something and, and, and they left some port open or, or whatever and, and that, that got exploited, right? Um, automation is a key here. I think that uh, you might have heard this, this, this concept of infrastructure as code. Um, so in modern, modern data center, modern uh, applications, when you're building your server farm, you should never build things by hand. You should always work in automation tools like Chef, Puppet, Ansible. There's a whole bunch of different tools out there. And you start with the script, you start with the code, and you need to treat this code uh, as uh, the same way like Java code or, or Xcode, it needs to be evaluated from the perspective of um, coding and architecture standards and has to be checked into repository. So your sysops dev engineer actually modifies that code uh, that then instructs your, your provisioning pipelines to build and configure servers, right? So they start with the code, they do all the configuration of the servers through that code, through the recipes, then there's a build and provisioning pipelines that then takes that and provisions the infrastructure and then they can test it, right? Never, never go directly and start spinning instances and configuring instances by hand because that, that is not scalable. Plus, you don't really get an audit trail of actually what happened, right? Um, and before I hand it off to Curtis, I want to talk about um, something that is, uh, is has been emerging in the market for a while, but this notion of behavioral analysis. And that's something that we're investing very heavily in right now. So all the things that we've talked about in terms of best practices on the application side, best practices when it comes to your network and communication layer between the client and the server, all the best practices on the server side, all that stuff is great, but all it does is just you're, 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 you're improving your security stance making it harder for people to crack, right? So you're just raising that bar. But uh, I can tell you that you can spend a year building the, per the most perfect security and it's gonna take a black hat guy at a conference trying to prove something a day to crack, right? And, uh, and what's gonna end up happening is that you, yes, you, you, you made it very hard, but you didn't make it impossible, right? So you need to also prepare for the fact that whatever security uh, principles you, you implement your development, you need to also be very defensive and assume that that security will be broken, right? Um, so ask yourself, okay, so what do I do if the security is broken and, and people are writing fake clients or figure it out a way to interact with my APIs and I, I cannot distinguish between the real client and the real client. 
you need to start essentially using big data analysis to start figuring out what is the actual behavior of the normal user, right? You need to start tracking analytics from the device in terms of, you know, how are the people actually using the device? Uh, you can go as far as actually gathering accelerometer data from the device and, and distinguishing uh, things like, oh, this guy has been right-handed, right? Because you can tell how the device is being used in one position, the angle. Right? And if someone all of a sudden is, is left-handed, you know, that could be a flag, right? So that's an example of, of that sort of analysis, right? Uh, things that are, um, that could be done much easier, you could be, uh, st you could start measuring things like, um, uh, let's say take Grinder for example. In Grinder, you have this concept of blocking someone, right? Um, a lot of times, spammers don't really block anybody because the, all they care about is like, I'm going to create a fake account so, so then I can get access to your network using that account and then I'm going to spam users, right? So if you look at those accounts, they have zero blocks or zero favorites, right? That could be a flag. So you could probably gather 30, 50 different data points and come up with some sort of algorithm that scores all that stuff and calculates this trust index. So you need to be calculating a trust index for all those users real time. And depending on, on that trust index, then you want to start allowing or disallowing things. Right? So again, one thing that I want to highlight is, yes, application, network, data center security principles, all that have to be in place to make things much harder. But really what you need to also be investing in is, is either partnering with someone who already does that, provides that capability, or you need to build it yourself where you start tracking um, actual real usage, real user behavior, and start detecting anomalies and shutting those down, right? Okay, any questions on all this? I know I kind of flew by all this stuff. Uh, I just want to make sure that we have time for Curtis. Any question on, on, on security uh, from what I've talked about? Yes? So you, you will get false positives, right? Especially at the very beginning. Uh, but that you can use that data to train your model better, right? Uh, but the reality is that there will be users who will be caught in the net because they did something funky. Um, an example would be, let's say, you know, I set up my algorithm so it tracks how many messages you send per minute, right? And I, and I set the bar simplistically at 20 messages per minute, right? And someone got very creative and they're very good at copy and paste and, and they're just, you know, sending 50 messages, right? And, and they got caught, right? So, I mean, you have to have customer service, you have to have a way to kind of prevent the contact and then verify and all that stuff. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes. Yes. Indirectly. So the question was, are we using social network analysis to detect whether some, someone is fake? So um, we have partnered with a um, um, couple of companies that are helping us essentially to, to improve our stance, right? And um, um, they do that, right? So for example, um, if I have an IP that you're coming from, Right? I can cross-reference that IP with 
a larger network that tracks things like what's going on against the IP, right? Or um, if I'm validating your phone number, there are companies that can tell me what is the trust index of that of the number, and they actually calculate that. So, so you don't have to build it yourself, but the 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 answer is yes, indirectly. Any other questions? Everyone is ready for iOS? All right. Curtis. And I'm going to decrease the temperature here. You guys hear me? I like that slide, Lucas. The render presentation wouldn't be complete without a muted bell pick. I don't know if you guys saw, but it's a Leonardo da Vinci um, anatomy thing. Anyway, give me a second to set up. Sorry, bear with me for a second. My system's frozen. Hopefully, it'll come back. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Actually, um, if, if any grinder guys have a, has a PC, I, I can play this on the cloud. My, my system's just frozen. Okay. Cool. Maybe. Oh, there we go. Cool. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah. Oh, wait, is that, was that you? Oh, that's me, right? That's you, okay. <laughs> Curtis May, uh, I work for Grindr on the iOS team, and I'm here to talk about security on iOS. So um, there's two parts of this presentation. Um, in the first part, I'm just going to talk about iOS-specific um, security features, um, the stuff that the platform basically gives you for free or that you can turn on very easily. And the second half um, will be a little more general. Um, it will apply to Android as well, or just mobile in general. Um, it's just stuff that I've had personal experience with in the security realm. And like Lucas said, um, security is a vast topic. You know, there's no perfect security. There's no way we can cover every topic in a tech talk. But um, the, the idea is to maybe give you just a general overview um, and direct you to some resources that you can go to for further information. So um, with iOS, the first um, security feature I want to talk about is just the app sandbox. So in iOS, every app can be considered an island. Um, basically, in that um, um, diagram you see at the top, there's a bundle container. That's the um, app that you distribute. So that's the app and all the data that is delivered via the app store. And it's signed securely with a certificate so it can be verified so that someone is unable to tamper with it and, and deliver you an altered version of the app. The iPhone will detect that, um, or the iDevice. 
Um, the data container is where all the data the app works with is stored, and um, no other app on the system is able to access your data container. Um, that's what we mean by the sandbox and what every app is an island um, refers to. And optionally, you can also store things securely in iCloud, which is something Apple provides um, for the Apple platform. So talking further about the app sandbox, um, the app is bundled um, in a non tamperable container. Even it can't touch that data. I mean, you can read it, but it can't write to it. Um, and in its own data, um, other apps can't access it. Um, and the app can store data securely to iCloud. Now, even though no apps can access it, like Lucas said, if that device is jailbroken, or even if you um, connect a um, certain utilities such as iExplorer, you can actually access data from the iPhone. And um, unless it's encrypted, you know, any hacker could just connect their iPhone to such an application and get the data. Um, so, as of, I think I was seven, very recently, um, Apple just added a switch that you can um, turn on in Xcode, which is the tool that Apple provides for developing iOS applications. And what it does is it gives you complete protection, which is the highest level of protection that um, is offered. And we'll get into different levels in the next slide. Um, the user's passcode and the unique device ID is used to encrypt the data. So that unique device ID is actually stored in a chip, so it's very difficult for a hacker to access because it doesn't live in memory or on disk. Um, so these are the different protection levels that um, iOS provides. And this um, affects, applies not only to documents on disk, but also the keychain. So the, the best level of protection is complete. Um, data is accessible only when the device is unlocked. So as soon as that device goes to sleep or you lock it, um, that, that data is no longer available. Um, basically, it's encrypted. Uh, the second level is protected unless open. So basically, um, the, um, the files open by your app are accessible by your app, even when the device is locked until they're closed. Um, so this might be useful for a GPS app that still needs to access data um, even when the device is locked. Um, the next one is protected until first user authentication. So that's basically accessible until the, uh, after the user first unlocks their phone after a reboot. Um, it's not a very good level of protection. It, it is the default in iOS 7, so if you do nothing else, if you deploy to iOS 7 and 8, you at least get that level. Um, but like I said, it's not recommended. Um, no protection, of course, is very <laughs> unrecommended and um, Apple's deprecating it with iOS 9. So, uh, just wanted to talk about HTTPS. Um, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about HTTPS. A lot of people think it's less secure than it is, but it is an industry standard and it is quite secure um, if, if you use, use it the way it was intended to be used. Um, banking applications, if you go to your bank uh, in a browser, it uses HTTPS. Um, and if it's good enough for a bank, it's, it's pretty good. There are very rare edge cases where you know, it can be defeated, but in general, it's really good. It's provided by the OS. All you have to do is access a URL um, that begins with HTTPS. And if you use that uh, built-in class that's provided by iOS, you basically get um, all that for free. Um, so be wary of tampering with iOS's default behavior. Um, I worked at a company where while the project was being developed, they disabled the certificate checking because their certificate had expired, and they forgot to re-enable that check once they deployed to production, so basically it was worthless. Um, so the next thing is iOS Keychain. Uh, that's used for securely storing small pieces of data, such as passwords, private keys. Um, it uses the same levels that are offered by um, data production. Um, best practice, prefer using complete protection. Um, Apple Pay. We don't use Apple Pay, but um, it's a core feature offered by iOS, so I wanted to touch upon it. Apple Pay is secure. It uses an industry standard chip called the Secure Element, and also a chip provided 
created by Apple called Secure Enclave. Um, and it's used to securely encrypt um, transactions. It's also private. It does not collect any transaction information that can be tied back to the user, or at least that's what Apple says. <laughs> so um, I want to touch upon things that are new, upcoming in iOS 9. So um, iOS 9 supports TLS 1.2. TLS 1.2 was released in, or introduced in 2008 or 2009. And um, I think iOS 9 will be the first mobile OS to support it. Um, so it offers everything that previous versions of TLS offered and introduces perfect for secrecy support for new Cypher suites. So like if, for example, someone was capturing your traffic and then at some point <clears throat> captured your, um, or figured out what your uh, private key was, um, they could actually decrypt that historical data. They want, you know, if you change your, you know, what you probably do is once you're compromised, you change the key so that, the, you know, hackers wouldn't be able to decrypt your data. But if you had the data that was used to encrypt the old data, they could still decrypt it. So with TLS 1.2, that's no longer possible. Um, iOS 9 also introduces Touch ID off. So this is different than just Touch ID support, which Apple has had for a while. This is um, a secure authentication mechanism that Apple is providing um, that uses Touch ID. And um, iOS 9 is introducing app transport security. So this is something that um, by default, if you build for iOS 9, you get. And app, iOS 9 will prevent <coughs> any access to HTTP, everything has to be HTTPS by default, and also the servers that you connect to need to support TLS 1.2. Now you can opt out, like if you're talking to a server that doesn't support TLS 1.2, or if you're you know, accessing certain resources over HTTP, you have the ability to explicitly opt out, but um, they make, it, make you have to work for that. So beyond iOS, so this is um, just things I've learned of like different things that um, um, security concerns that uh, I have based on my experience, you know, in doing iOS development. So first of all, REST, um, almost every app I've ever programmed has consumed RESTful services. Um, so as, as an engineer, I consider it also my, even if I don't develop the RESTful endpoints, I consider it my responsibility to um, do as much as I can to make sure that those endpoints um, are secure and well designed. Because we're all part of a team, we're all developing a product together, we all want it to be um, high quality. And based on my experience, I've encountered certain problems over and over again. So I, I bring that to the table. Like uh, I know, um, I'll give an example of, of something that, that's very common in my experience um, later in the slide. So first of all, always assume that a hacker can identify the APIs your app uses, even if you obfuscate them, just you should operate under the assumption that uh, they'll be able to figure it out. So your duty as on the server side is to make sure um, people cannot misuse your service. Either they can't do denial of service attacks, they um, can't um, um, do things with permissions that they're not entitled to. Um, so the second point is make sure your apps, APIs do not grant clients any permissions they don't need. Um, and I'll give you an example. So I work at MySpace and the MySpace toolbar, um, its API allowed a login user to basically impersonate another user. So you could actually obtain a login token for any user on the system and then the web browser would basically think you're that user. So. Um, if you guys use MySpace, you probably remember Tom, you're everyone's friend. Um, someone someone in, in our company showed us how they could use this um, hack to um, go to Tom's page and change stuff. Um, luckily, we identified the problem before the user community did, but it would have been pretty bad if they had found it first. Um, and and that, that actually, exa that example, that's come back to haunt me like with almost every project I've worked at. Every project seems to have some way you can make an API call on behalf of another user at some level. It may not have been as egregious as this, but 
it's a common theme. So, and the last point is um, don't send sensitive data in query strings. I think Lucas' slides touched on that too. Um, HTTP servers often log URLs and files that are viewable by anyone with access to those files. So, um, yeah, you don't want to have like a password in a query string, just not the best, not a good practice. Um, logging, also, Lucas touched upon this. Um, don't log sensitive data, such as passwords, to the system console. It's, there, it's easy for a hacker to, who has a phone to look at that. Um, and third party frameworks. Um, Lucas also talked about that. Um, I'll go into it um, in, in a little more detail. So I think it's really important to bet any third party code that you include in your app. Um, I would recommend just doing an internet search to discover outstanding issues, not just security issues, but you want um, to identify like, does it do what it's advertised to do? Um, is it stable? Is it good quality? Um, identify what's logged to the console and what is sent over the internet. Make sure it's not violating your privacy policy. Like, it has access to a lot of information about a third party embedded in your um, executable has access to a lot of information. Has access to the, possibly the geolocation, the device, um, all sorts of stuff that you don't necessarily want sent to um, over the network. Um, yeah, and, and ask yourself or check it. Um, use like Charles proxy or, or use use Wireshark. Check to see if it's sending out information over the internet. And if it is, check to see if it's encrypted or not. Um, look especially close at analytics. I would say especially analytics because. That's usually going to, if you're sending sensitive information, that's generally going to be uh, more on you uh, because you decide what to send to the analytics frameworks for the most part. And they document, generally document what they also capture. So definitely scrutinize analytics. Make sure you're not sending information that violates your um, privacy policy. Um, also add upsell and AB testing frameworks. Those are also good to look at in closer detail. Um, identify the data you send to third parties. Again, like analytics, just make sure that you're not violating your own privacy policy. Um, also, do you trust them enough with that data? You know, they're a third party, they could be compromised. Um, sockets. So, um, we talked about HTTPS. If you use Apple's um, system provided classes, you get that pretty much for free. Uh, but if you communicate over sockets, you either have to use a third party library, if you have to do it yourself at a low level, um, make sure that if you want to be secure that the data that you send is encrypted. And never roll your own encryption. Um, prefer standards such as TLS. Unless you're a security expert, it's pretty much a given that you're going to get it wrong. So other resources. Um, so Apple has a really great resource on iOS security that goes into 100 times more detail than I did. Um, it's at that URL, um, the iOS security guide. It's a PDF. It's really good. And um, there's a really good video that Apple has on security, um, specifically um, some of the new stuff that's coming in iOS 9 that, that I touched upon. And that's um, called Security and, and Your Apps. And you, you can do an internet search for WWDC and um, the title of the presentation. And that's it. Any questions? With the secure element can be used for applications other than the iPad, like you want to secure all public privacy settings and things like that? Um, no, I believe that, um, well, there's a secure element, which is an industry standard um, that Apple uses for Apple Pay, but there's also the secure enclave, which is basically a chip, and I think it's totally. Um, um, basically hidden from you, it's, it's encapsulated. Even the even iOS cannot access the private keys stored in it. So basically when you want something encrypted or decrypted, you talk to the chip and the chip returns the decrypted or encrypted stream back to you. So yeah, even, even iOS doesn't know what the keys are. But then your, your applications can access that? Um, you can use it um, with the Touch ID, as far as I know. Well, you can definitely use it with the Touch ID um, um, secure authentication that's coming in iOS 9. I don't know if it provide if you can access it in any other way. Yeah, I, I just don't know. Any other questions? What if uh, your device is uh, IJ? Yeah. 
Can you consider your application also is secure? Yeah, so if you, um, you use the complete uh, protection that Apple offers, actually pretty much any of them, but the, the cool thing about complete protection is as soon as the device is locked, um, that the data is inaccessible. Actually, I think the keys use... Even if it's jailbroken. Even if jailbroken, yeah, phones, yeah. Um, in fact, the, um, some of the keys used to encrypt the data are thrown away, and um, they're regenerated the next time the user logs in. <laughs> any, any other questions? Cool. Thanks.